Uh, so good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ryan Locke and I'm introducing this session today. Um, the reason I'm here is thanks to the Axon Johnson Foundation. I'm a PhD student at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And uh, what an honor it is for us and this group to be the closers for the first day of the conference. Uh, like running a race or a, a marathon, uh, not that I've ever run one before, but I understand that at the end you speed up very quickly to get across the finish line. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, in the next hour, we have a dynamic lineup of professionals that are all involved with promoting the importance of public space in their everyday work. Speed presentations are a chance for participants from the crowd to speak to all of us and highlight the great work that they do and the issues and challenges that they face. They all have incredible stories to share with you. So these are people who are deeply involved in studying, observing, innovating, cooperating, promoting, and writing about places, and some who probably do all of that at once. Their stories can serve as an interpretation of what's being done out there and what needs to be done. So to save myself from mispronouncing their names and to conserve time, the participants will introduce themselves as they come onto stage and the organizations that they represent. Please give a warm welcome to this session. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for choosing this room. Uh, my name is Hans Karsenberg. Uh, I'm from Stipo. It's an independent uh, urban development uh, team based in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam. Uh, we do a lot in placemaking, uh, among others, uh, together with uh, PPS on the museum plan, which is a great project, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, and um, I would like to use my presentation uh, to talk about uh, this book that we've written together with uh, 40 co-authors as an open source book free to download for uh, everybody. The City at Eye Level. Um, the City at Eye Level focuses on, you could say, one aspect of placemaking, uh, which is... Uh, okay, I get a little bit. Is this better? Okay, thank you. Um, that's the Dutch height. Uh, the city at eye level focuses on uh, the aspect of how buildings connect with uh, the streets and can contribute to the streets or not. And um, we have a Dutch word for that, that's the plint. The plint is the ground floor of the building, but it's also what is behind it. So it's just more, more than just a facade and it's more than just a ground floor. So we're trying to introduce, to sneak this new English word into the English language, the plint. The plinth. So I hope you can remember that word after this presentation. And at the end, I would like to invite you, uh, as this is an open source project, to uh, co come on board and to share your uh, ideas and develop the project further, because it's an ongoing project. Uh, well, let me give you a glance of the book and uh, start with a couple of examples. This is the, the plan of the historic city of Haarlem in the, in the Netherlands. And if you study a, a plan like this, you when you come out of the train station, you'd expect, I guess, uh, uh, historic, organic buildings, a nice street, a warm welcome. And this is how the city of Harlem welcomes you. So um, this is what really baffles us. This, this is something that architects have been working uh, on. And this building completely destroys the square in front, of the, uh, in front of the train station. And also the first impression you get of the city of Harlem but then you could say, well, that's what we did in the 60s, um, when the, in the modernist times. But this is what we did in the 70s, and this is what we did in the 80s. And then this is what we've been doing in the 90s. And here it says, blind wall, or blank wall. <laughs> and, um, well, we've seen a lot of pictures of Amsterdam today, uh, of the canals uh, as a kind of Valhalla, but unfortunately, this is also Amsterdam. And uh, this is in the city center. And this facade was built five years ago, and it is a facade on the south, and it faces a square. So what would happen if it, this, this building, which is a cultural building, by the way, it's the Film Academy, um, would just have one door, one door with a restaurant behind it, and it could have a terrace out on the street, and it would bring the street alive. The pedestrian stream uh, is killed because of this, uh, this plinth, this uh, terrible, terrible plinth. And it can look like this, or like this, or like this. It doesn't necessarily need to be about old buildings. It can be about new buildings as well. 
are about like this, very important in, is the transition between the building and the, and the public space. Uh, or like this, or this. Or even residential plinths. It doesn't only, it's not only about shops, it's not only about retail spaces. We can't fill the whole city with shops. We can get better streets on, on, on residential uh, uh, buildings as well. Or like this. Or again, in a modern uh, situation. So, um, what we, uh, how, the way we look at the public space, we make a distinction between the public space and the public realm. And what we notice is that uh, a lot of cities, when they try to improve their streets, they look at the public space. That's the horizontal surface you see lined out here. So that's the street pavement and the way the, the street is uh, cut up. But if you walk on the streets, uh, that's not all you see. You see the buildings as well. You experience also the, the facades of the buildings. Uh, so you, you experience not the public space, but the public realm. That's what we call the public realm. So for us, we try to work on projects that include both the city and the, the private building owners and the, the users of, of buildings to bring the streets alive. And within uh, this facade, most important is what you see on eye level, the ground floor, the plinth. So the street plinth may be only 10% of a building, but it determines 90% of the experience. And you can have a very ugly building, but if the plinth is alive, then the street is still nice. And you can have a beautiful building, but if it has a blank wall on the ground floor, then the street is still killed. So the plinth is really important. And you can actually actively do something about it. This is in a project we've been working on in Rotterdam. And this is before, and this is after. Just by bringing in new functions on the ground floor, a culture of functions, bringing the plinth to life, and this area which was considered unsafe at night to cycle through, all of a sudden comes a little bit alive because there are a couple of people outside on the street. So if you know all that, we are always wondering why don't we get better plinths? Why is that not self-evident? Uh, well, we heard a lot of stories already, um, so I won't go through all of them, but we noticed that architects, most architects tend to focus on the building rather than on the street. Uh, developers, there are developers uh, that have a short-term profit focus rather than a long-term profit focus. Luckily, there are developers who have a long-term profit focus as well. They, they have a different idea about this. Building owners, like for instance for office buildings, they're most of the time they're happy if they have one single tenant and they leave the ground floor open rather than uh, create small units and different users there to connect with the street. Users, they shut out the street, they pull down the blinds, they put the, the archives down there. Uh, a lot of bad plinths are from government buildings, I noticed throughout the years. Uh, because government buildings, they don't want to connect with the street somehow. They put the archives or the meeting rooms uh, there. And then the cities themselves, they rather focus on the pavement and not on the, the whole uh, experience of the public realm. So that's what this book was for, to create insights in how we can change this uh, situation. It's an open source book, so you can download it for free on the website, and we did that deliberately because we wanted to uh, develop the, uh, this uh, insights by sharing. Um, and we wrote it together with 41 co-authors. There are international case studies, and throughout the book we derived 75 lessons, which I will go through now. No, I won't. Uh, but it contains criteria for good plins. Um, it contains also methods uh, because knowing how you get good plins is one part, but the methods for organizing the process and the collaboration between the building owners and the city and the users uh, and get street coalitions going, do the street management, that's more than the other half, and that's where it always gets complicated. So it's not just something in the Netherlands, I think. It's something that many, many cities are walking, uh, working uh, on, and we heard a couple of great examples today. Um, we also went to Stockholm with this book and um, uh, did workshops there. Workshops with, uh, uh, with different people, silos within the city, but also with developers, also with um, the, the, the users. Uh, so very uh, building the street coalitions. So getting the good plinths is about the hardware, the design, but also about the software, the use, and perhaps more about the use than the design in the first place and very much about the orgware, how you manage to get a kind of a street management uh, going. Just a glance at the criteria, three scale levels, 
they're in the book. And about the methods, it's very important to actually go out, walk the streets, do it together in interdisciplinary teams, uh, have workshops uh, with uh, uh, all the people involved in better plants um, and work on streets, but you can also work on the entire inner city like here we did in, in the city of Rotterdam. It was one of the cases in the, in the book. Last, I would like to invite you to join the community. We have a Facebook page uh, to share knowledge and information. I already talked to a lot of people who work on similar projects, so it would be great to share our ideas and this book is not finished yet, we're keeping to continue it. So please come to us, download the book, and uh, be a part of the community. Thank you. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Bueno, mi nombre es Fernando Álvarez de Celis, yo soy director general de planeamiento de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. La idea de esta breve ponencia es explicar en qué consistió el programa Prioridad Peatón en el centro de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. Bueno, primero marcar que la Ciudad de Buenos Aires tiene 3 millones de habitantes, pero otros 3 millones ingresan diariamente a la ciudad. El área central concentra gran parte de la población, unos... 1.200.000 habitantes, 300.000 habitantes vienen todos los días a la ciudad, de las cuales 850.000 trabajan y el resto son residentes, o sea, una pequeña parte de residentes, y tenemos un ingreso muy fuerte todos los días de 700.000 automóviles, 110 líneas de colectivos, eh, 8 líneas de subterráneo, 6 de trenes, o sea, tenemos mucho ingreso de población todos los días al, al centro de la ciudad, lo que había creado una congestión de este área de la, de la ciudad y... A partir de ahí, en el año 2008, se produce el programa Prioridad Peatón que intenta revertir esta cuestión que se ve claramente en estas antiguas fotos de mucho espacio para el transporte automotor privado y de colectivos y poco espacio para el transporte peatonal. Se generó el metrobús sobre la avenida 9 de Julio, lo que permitió descongestionar el tránsito de transporte público hacia esa arteria importante de la ciudad y el resto se fue transformando hacia lo que se conoce prioridad peatón. Para hacer el diagnóstico partimos de dos indicadores, uno el indicador de compacidad corregida y otro el de caminabilidad, y se sustentaba con un índice de sustentabilidad urbana que desarrolló el modelo territorial de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires, donde hay 70 indicadores que tienen un dato obviamente al momento cero y se va viendo cómo a lo largo del tiempo va mejorando esos indicadores con las políticas públicas y obviamente con la recepción ciudadana que tiene esas políticas. Ahí lo que podemos ver es la compacidad corregida, que es decir, la relación entre espacio privado y espacio público, lo que obviamente tenía el centro de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires era mucho espacio privado, pero poco espacio público peatonal. El promedio en la Ciudad de Buenos Aires es de 500 y en la en el área central era de 85 y el ideal es de 200, quiere decir que había mucho espacio privado y poco espacio público, lo que generaba una congestión muy importante de ese área de la, de la ciudad. Y en ese cami de caminabilidad lo que se intenta es ver cómo es el confort peatonal, la movilidad, la, la atracción de, del caminar y obviamente la calidad ambiental, con lo cual se va midiendo cada transformación para ver cómo era el antes y el después de cada una de estas arterias. Acá hay solamente tres fotos que muestran cómo fue el desarrollo del área central desde el punto de vista de la caminabilidad y hay una experiencia muy rica que es del año 1936 donde se hace peatonal la calle Florida, que es una peatonal que todavía sigue existiendo obviamente y después eso fue como dejado de lado y predominó el transporte automotor hasta que ahora se desarrolló un programa de prioridad peatón que permite el ingreso de automóviles pero solamente cuando van al punto terminal y no de traspaso por el área central. Bueno, aquí están cuáles son los objetivos del de programa, mejorar la, la caminabilidad, la sustentabilidad ambiental, el tema de las bicicletas, ahí están, digamos, cuáles acciones implementadas, obviamente el recuperar el espacio público fuertemente, la renovación de lo que es la iluminaria, lo que es el mobiliario urbano, y ese lugar donde estaba también la historia de la ciudad, así que preservar la característica histórica de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. Aquí hay algunos resultados, lo que estoy mostrando es la planificación, no el proyecto urbano, y lo que podemos ver es cómo fue un proceso paulatino, desde los últimos cinco años 
se fueron haciendo calles por calle, la primera fue la, la arteria Reconquista, que hay que recordar que tuvo bastante resistencia desde el punto de vista de los vecinos de ese lugar, ya que decían que iba a empeorar su situación, digamos esto que hoy parece, y en este Congreso también se ve que la cuestión peatonal, o la, la cuestión del caminar tanto mejora las ciudades, no estaba tan incorporado en la ciudad de Buenos Aires, así que tuvo que haber todo un proceso cultural de cambio para poder desarrollarlo. Y lo que se demostró fue en números cómo aumentó, por un lado cómo bajó la compacidad corregida, es decir, el aumento del espacio público, y cómo se incorporó tantos metros cuadrados de espacio público peatonal a este área del centro de la ciudad de Buenos Aires. Mejorando, por supuesto, la, la cuestión económica, social y ambiental. La cuestión ambiental es central, pero obviamente que la cuestión económica en un lugar tan importante como la central también es importante, y obviamente la cuestión social de una ciudad que se estaba cerrando hacia sí misma, con el tema de la inseguridad y demás, cómo salir y que el espacio público sea el que permita recuperar la ciudad. Aquí algunos datos de recuperación económica, la calle Reconquista, que fue la primera, el valor inmobiliario aumentó un 35% por encima del valor de mercado del resto de la ciudad, con lo cual mostró que esto, aparte de mejorar las cuestiones ambientales, mejoraba también la cuestión económica del lugar. Lo mismo pasó con los locales comerciales, los comerciantes tenían miedo de que los locales les fuera peor y pasó todo lo contrario, aumentó la cantidad de gente que caminaba por el lugar aumentando obviamente la cuestión comercial, y esto permitió que muchos comerciantes pidieran que sus calles también pasaran a ser prioridad peatón, así que hubo un efecto contagio muy bueno y que permitió acelerar el proceso de obra. Y desde el punto de vista ambiental, el índice de caminabilidad lo que permite ver aquí, arteria por arteria, cómo fue mejorando y a cada proyecto se le fueron incorporando cuestiones ambientales que no estaban en proyectos anteriores, como por ejemplo el soterramiento de los residuos o más incorporación de, de árboles, o sea, se fue incorporando en cada uno de los proyectos cuestiones ambientales que va, iban mejorando la relación del de proyecto. Aquí están cómo fueron mejorando los indicadores. Esto es la conectividad también, porque los intenta que la gente camine, que haya puntos de inicio y de fin, o sea, que haya un, un corredor ambiental entre distintas áreas de la, de, del centro de la ciudad. Aquí, esto lo paso rápido, pero cómo fueron mejorando los indicadores de, de sustentabilidad en este área de la ciudad y cómo a nivel general permitió un cambio, que parece pequeño, pero es bastante importante en los indicadores del de mejoramiento de la ciudad. Aquí simplemente algunas imágenes para terminar, cómo era la calle Reconquista en el año 2008 y cómo a partir de la 2009 se pudo cambiar y cómo el resto de las arterias del de área central de la ciudad de Buenos Aires fueron cambiando y mejorando su calidad urbanística. La gente no usaba el espacio público y hoy si van por el área central van a ver a los oficinistas almorzando, van a ver, digamos, mucha actividad en esta zona de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. Muchísimas gracias. ¿eh? Uh, Kathleen Dunn, I'm a professor of uh, sociology, is that okay? I'm a professor of sociology at Loyola uh, University in Chicago. And I'm going to talk to you about the research I've been doing since I think about 2008 with street vendors. Um, I did my field work with two street vendor labor organizations in New York City. Um, but I'm also going to kind of speak to the global context of street vending as an issue um, that's really relevant for this conference with urban public space. and. The point of departure is this, is that we have to sort of challenge some of our class assumptions about the purpose of um, public space and how it should be uh, organized. I love cafe tables and places to sit um, as much as the next person, but for hundreds of millions of people, urban public space is a workplace. Um, and if we're going to really create inclusive public spaces, then we need to sort of understand uh, for our street vendors how and why this workplace Um, is necessary for them and ways in which we can incorporate them into the, um, the policy plan planning process and kind of declassify them as basically um, low-grade criminals. So I approach this very much from a, a, as it being a question of a right to the city, right? Um, whose streets um, and for what use. Um, so in New York City, let me talk a little bit about the situation there. Um, The vast majority of street vendors are first-generation immigrants. 
Um, there, are, there is a very, very complex system of regulating street vending in New York, which I'll speak to in a minute. Um, but the most common experience, where I, I interviewed about 80 street vendors over the course of a few years. Um, the main thing that street vendors in New York are gonna to talk to you about is interactions with the police um, and kind of experiences of racialization and criminalization. So there's, this is an example of a, one of the many tickets they get. It's literally a pink slip um, until this year, the completion of a success, successful campaign run by the Street Vendor Project. Tickets for very minor violations, like having a box that kind of goes outside your um, table by an inch, um, could go up to $1,000, right? So I met vendors who had like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in unpaid tickets. Um, so it, it liter literally is kind of a pink slip. Um, arrests are very common, confiscation of goods that aren't always returned. Um, so there's this very strong pressure of criminalization from the state, and recently um, there's a new kind of force um, coming, creating pressure for the immigrant vendors, and that's kind of this gent gentrifying force. So this gourmet food truck movement has taken off really um, across the United States, and in New York um, it's taken place kind of through concerted policy inaction because food permits are not available anymore from the city and they haven't been for 20 years. So um, unless all of these sort of, you know, kind of like my age, 30 something um, folks put their name on a list back in eighth grade, <laughs> they probably didn't get a um, permit legitimately, right? They got it on the underground economy. And um, these people have formed their own um, business association and speak very frankly about wanting to transform the industry um, from being run by peddlers or hawkers to an industry being run by business, um, or yeah, by businesses. So uh, this is, for example, what a food truck rally looks like in New York City. This is in Brooklyn. Um, this is a social event. It's sort of like an outdoor um, food court. And this is an example of a street vendor protest in New York City. Um, this was in support of the campaign to lower the fines against street vendors. And you'll notice the sign street vendors are workers. That was sort of one of the deep questions animating my research is how, how, did the, how and why do these people who are ostensibly small business owners come to identify as like laborers and form and join labor organizations, which they do in hundreds of cities around the world. Um, so just very, very quickly, <clears throat> To explain why there are these protests in New York, um, there's about 25,000 vendors in New York at least. It's regulated horrifically through seven different agencies have jurisdiction over vendors. The hundreds of streets are closed to vending altogether. Um, you can read the figures on how much money they spend policing it. There's one unit that just works in Manhattan that it costs about almost $5 million a year that is exclusively devoted to policing vendors. But I want you to pay attention to the caps on the ownership rights. Um, so for food vending permits, there's only about 3,100. Um, and if you got this from the city, it would be $200 for a two-year term. During the course of my research on the underground economy that has developed for these permits because of the caps, the permit went from being going for like maybe 12,000 um, to 20,000. That's in the space of about five years. So a lot of that pressure is being created by um, the comparatively more affluent food truck owners who are kind of coming in and um, raising the ceiling for that. So in actuality, a lot of the food vendors, most of the food vendors working in New York City actually don't own their own cart um, or truck. They're actually workers or subcontractors working for like basically a, a permit landlord. Um, so that's important to understand. Um, so not only are our streets and urban public space, uh, a workplace, but they're a very stratified workplace, and you can really see that in New York. Obviously, there's massive diversity, um, a lot of ethnic niches without the, within the industry, um, but you you really have a both a socio, I would say, a socio-spatial kind of stratification where the gourmet food trucks owners tend not to really work on their carts, and they hire predominantly native-born. Um, white uh, New Yorkers to work on the carts. Um, really importantly, when, you, when I interviewed these people, absolutely no one had been arrested. <laughs> and reports, uh, qualitatively, the way they discussed police interactions was that it was sort of inefficient and a nuisance, but not a threat to one's livelihood and certainly not an issue of criminalization. 
Then in Manhattan, you'll notice that it tends to be immigrant men who dominate the street vending sector in, Man in Manhattan. That's, of course, the most lucrative place in the city to vend. When you get out to the outer boroughs, that's where you see a lot more of the immigrant women vending. And these are less lucrative places, yet they actually have more autonomy because they, they tend to really be their own boss and they're not working on carts for somebody else. So um, this is why we've got basically at this point a global um, labor movement against criminalization. And here's an example of um, one person's perspective of like why he feels that being a vendor, is, it's like being a worker. Um, you know, if I were a business owner, can you imagine? The police wouldn't bother me then, right? So this is just some things for you to consider that across the U.S. there's a number of immigrant-led campaigns to uh, decriminalize street vending. It's also happening globally in India. This year passed the first national level law to protect street vendors' livelihoods. What's really striking about this movement is that despite all these national cultural contexts that vary widely, they have extremely common demands. Um, they want to be the profession to be decriminalized, they want to reduce police harassment, reform regulation, and they want inclusion in the municipal planning and policy making process. And as I said, these street labor groups can be found in hundreds of cities. So as folks who are involved in organizing and managing public spaces, I would invite you to consider them as constituents in how to build more inclusive public spaces. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Um, I am Samiha Sheth from uh, India, from a city called Ahmedabad, which is where our new prime minister comes from, so it's in a limelight right now. And um, I represent a, an organization called International Center for Sustainable Cities. It's a small organization working on um, core city revitalization, heritage uh, conservation in, in urban areas, you know, more to, uh, from um, moving away from building. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is a case of uh, a street called Hollywood in Ahmedabad, and what are the problems and what um, and why it is actually a problem for people who are not there, and why it is a it is more of a celebration for people who are there. Um, so, as you know, India is uh, one of the most rapidly growing um, countries in, in, in Asia and um, where most of the cities are trying to struggle to get, um, you know, basic infrastructure in place and basic services and toilets and all of that, where public spaces and parks and all of that is often not in the, mo in the radar and often not really even talked about, you know, when, when it comes to uh, city's focus or mayor's focus or, uh, or for funding. You know, it is never on a limelight and that's why it is something which is very crucial for people to think about. And um, uh, the city of Ahmedabad is about uh, 7 million people. It's, a, it's not a big city. It's a middle, uh, sort of a, uh, it's almost a small city where not pe many people would want to go. Um, it's a dry state, so it's a dry city, so no alcohol. So it's a, uh, it's a very unique city in a, in a way. Uh, where uh, the, the street which I'm going to talk about is, is a street which is... Um, which houses about 200 to 2,500 families, which is about, um, you know, into five, so about 7,000 people who live there, work there, and do everything possible in that one little uh, street. So, um, how the, now the presentation is going to show how that place becomes the living area of their lives. And um, so here you can see how, um, you know, the, the light yellow, what you see is the slum, and the dark yellow is the residential neighborhood on the other side. And this street really um, uh, sort of connects residential area to the main central business district and institutional area. So it's a very, very um, important street. And it is the street which I take every day from my, ho my home to, uh, to my work. So it is, it's, 
it, it, it's for me, it's not work. It's every day. So I know, I, I, I know everything that happens, and I have you know sort of uh, gone through it, you know, happily and also in terms of uh, sadness. So here you can see it's a it's a very unique street where most of the people living here are migrants coming from uh, several places and out, outskirts of the city and also from the other uh, parts of the uh, state, and they make these Ganesh ideals, which are. Uh, which is again a religious, there's a big religious festival called Ganesh Chaturthi where people celebrate the, uh, the, uh, celebrate, um, the birth of that, uh, that god. And this is where you can see that, um, here you can see there is, it's one street where you see uh, rickshaws going by, you see um, Ganesh idols which are being sold, and you see people uh, selling vegetables, people living there, people sleeping there. There are also some... Um, um, here, you know, if you see, there are, uh, you can see these, um, um, there is a temple, so people are, pray, people are going to pray there. There are, um, you can see cots, there are these um, small little beds where people actually every day sleep in the night and also in the daytime. You know, a lot of times when you pass by or walk by, this is the place where you see a lot of people doing their daily routine and a lot of women here can see people are cooking, women are playing with their kids, so it becomes a street which is, um, you know, and often the, the street becomes the living area and very limited space for vehicular movement, which is, which uh, um, somehow is a problem because then, um, and because of that, the city is not willing to invest a single penny in this area because it is, the, it is doing congestion to traffic. And which is where the problem is all to these 7,000 people who are living there. So here, um, in this, this photograph actually represents, you know, where you can see there are small little um, areas where, you know, um, street hawkers are selling small you know, pebbles. Then there are a, a line of row of beds where people are sleeping. And on, right next to it, you see, are the Ganesh idols, where they are actually selling these Ganesh idols. And this is where, this is the only way of income. This is what they do for three months in a year. And uh, that is about it. That is what... Um, is their only way of uh, livelihood, and um, I already. And here, what happens is, um, where this is actually where it's all already a vehicular road, and this is exactly where all these activities are happening, and um, it, it, it creates. What it creates is a problem for people who are living there. You know, it is also for not just people who are um, who are uh, on on vehicles going and passing through this area, but also for people who are just crossing. You know, and there are a lot of eye accidents. There are a lot of um, um, you know traffic congestion problems. There are day daily. You know, a lot of people are breaking their houses. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of thefts. A lot of these idols are getting stolen just because to make little space for either people to go or for vehicles to go. And uh, because of this, the vulnerability in this area is extremely, extremely high. And people really don't want to go there in the night because you never know where, who is going to come and who, who is there who is very unhappy with the police who did something to them on the other uh, day. And therefore, I think, you know, and right now, with government, what we've gone through in last 10 years of working in this area is only to provide public toilets. And rest all is about, you know, about, uh, you know, putting, putting footpaths, doing, a re, uh, doing repaving, adding little landscapes. There are all plans. There are series of plans, and, uh, you know, you can make a book or a notebook for, um, uh, for this, this area, but nothing has been done because government want people to leave and these people want to be there. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, something where, you know, uh, really, um, you know, as, as a citizen of the city, it really concerns, and also as a planner, it is something which is always um, worrisome because, you know, you, who are you going to please and who are you going to help? And this is a chicken and egg for this kind of a situation. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, okay. Um, I promise you I won't go over the time limit on the slides. 
Um, this is my only slide. Um, my name is Joel Russell. I'm the executive director of an organization, a nonprofit organization called the Form Based Codes Institute, which is based in Chicago, Illinois, and, and uh, has practitioners all over the country. I actually work out of Mass Western Massachusetts, Northampton, Massachusetts. And we're an organization that is uh, dedicated to changing the regulations that underlie all of the problems you've been hearing about today and all of the opportunities. Um, we, hear, we talk about placemaking, we talk about all of the wonderful possibilities, all, all of the limitations, I, I mean the kinds of limitations in places like India and Latin America are so different from those in much of the United States, but um, underneath all of this is a system of rules and regulations that is simply not designed to create the kinds of places that we want. Now, where we have good, good bones for cities, like New York City and ma many other places where it's, it's easy to do the, the light, cheap, and easy things, um, you, you can get progress very quickly. But where you, particularly on the outskirts of cities, both in the United States and in Europe and in the third world, everywhere, we see this proliferation of development which does not create places. So although it's true that in order to, uh, in order to have vital and energized spaces, you, you need the kinds of activities that Fred Kent was talking about, and those are, those are things that are necessary. We don't yet know, have an operating system to create the kinds of places within which those things can happen. Um, and, that is because we're operating under a system of, of zoning laws that were created 100 years ago and may have had their reason for existing back then, but now they are completely dysfunctional and need to be changed. And there's, there's a lot of thinking going on about design, planning, urbanism. There has been pathetically little on actually changing the operating rules of the game. Um, and so the, there are a number of, of people who have been thinking about, well, how do we change zoning? Um, how do we make zoning for walkable communities? How do we make zoning for placemaking? Uh, how do we change those underlying rules? And that's the mission of the Form Based Codes Institute, is that we believe that it's the, it's the combination of how we design streets and how we design buildings, particularly, um, as the Dutch call them, the plinths of the buildings, the, the street level and how those, how the relationship between the street level of the buildings and the street itself, how those things connect because we have the wrong rules about it. So it's no accident that you get terrible urbanism in new buildings and even in good places like Amsterdam and it's even less of an accident that you get them on the outskirts of, of cities all over the world. Um, there are very, uh, I, as I understand it, there are only two new, new places in all of France that are being built along traditional principles, along the principles of traditional urbanism. So uh, we're devoted to changing those rules. And um, I'm just going to do two quick stories of, uh, of a particular dilemma, which has to do with uh, how, how you bring together two traditionally different silos of, of expertise, the traffic engineers on the one hand and the planners and architects on the other. Uh, we tend to design streets and, and with a very few exceptions, uh, one of whom is in the room here, uh, actually a couple of them, uh, streets have been designed for throughput of traffic, not to be places for people. We've heard that over and over again. But that's not, those aren't just concepts, those are written into the laws of the land. And so it's very hard to change those without getting enough of a consensus um, to get legislators to focus on the kind of topic that is frankly not very sexy or interesting to most, to most of them. Um, and at the same time, we, we have to um, get the zoning right. And so for many years, there was an attempt to change zoning rules without changing street design. And there, then there have been independent attempts to ch change street design without focusing on the zoning. If you don't get them both right and get them both right in the right order, you're not going to get the kind of urbanism that we want. So, um, and so for example, <clears throat> in the, uh, the, I live in a small city in western Massachusetts. Uh, we have a wonderfully vibrant downtown, the city of Northampton. Um, and it, 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 except for the fact that the street's too wide and a few other problems, it basically functions very well. 
But then there's an expansive street that just to the north of it, which is your typical suburban street that you saw many pictures of today from various presenters. The, the placeless uh, expanse of pavement with, with buildings too far apart to shape any space. Uh, there was an attempt to change the zoning to bring those buildings closer to the street. Uh, the, the street was kind of, a, compared to the downtown, was, was decrepit. And, um, but the street was not going to change quickly and the zoning failed because it didn't take account of the need to change the street. This, and this has unfolded in a number of places where I've worked. I, I've, been, I've been with the Foreign Based Codes Institute only seven, seven months. Before that, for 25 years, I was an independent um, planning and zoning consultant. And so I've seen this, uh, uh, this pattern. Um, another example, uh, another short story, uh, uh, which is a successful one, is actually in, in the, on the street where Victor Dover's office is uh, in South Miami in Florida, which was a similarly characterless place um, in, in not very long ago. And through the efforts of citizen activists, they focused first on getting the street right. And they got the, and they, they narrowed the street, they widened the sidewalks, they put in street trees. They did all of the things that you need to do to make a great street. And then they also changed the zoning to stop being so restrictive about uses and say, well, this is residential and that's commercial and that's industrial and you can only have two family houses here and one family house is there, but to allow a much wider variety. And that street has come back to life in an amazing way. And it's only because they did, they did both things, they did them in the right order and they did them very well. Um, so the, I think that underlying the issues that we're talking about here and something that needs greater focus from the people in this room as well as all, all of our constituencies is that need to not just uh, sort of think about how do we make places in theory or in the abstract or conceptually, but how do we actually rewrite the rules? How do we change the politicians' minds about what those rules should be? How do we get the public interested enough to take a stand and to demand change? Because that's what we really need to do. You start with the understanding of placemaking, but that understanding isn't going to get you anywhere unless you actually make change. And the exciting thing about what's happening in um, parts of Buenos Aires where we are now is that they are doing that with the streets and it's going to take a little time, but I think we're going to see some great results as a result of that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present it. Good evening. I'm going to take advantage of the position I am right now, so I'm going to take a picture of all of you. Uh, you can do one of the next three things while I'm taking the picture. You can either, or, well, you can, do it, you, you can do them all at the same time if you're able to do it, but you can either uh, uh, hug the, the person who is around you, like the, or you can even kiss them, or you can wave at, at, at the camera, okay? So here, this side of it. Okay, and now this. Not, lot of, not, not, not lots of kisses right now, but okay. Uh, my name is Francisco Palier Perez. I'm from Colombia. I'm a social psychologist. And uh, I do live in Mexico right now uh, with this very, 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 very famous office that it's called the Deriv Lab. It's very famous in my home because uh, we created this office with my wife, so we just talk about it every day. Uh, I would love for you to join us. Uh, in this conversation and further conversations, uh, you can contact us, info uh, at derivlab.org, uh, or just send us an, uh, a message on, on the Twitter. And what I'm going to do now is to show uh, one small project we have been doing in, in Querétaro, that it's a, a small city in Mexico uh, where we live, that it's called Galeria Balindam. This, this will be translated into Balindam Gallery. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, well, you can see what this is. It's, this is just like a very scary alley where if you try to walk it in the middle of the night. And uh, this is the place where, where, where we are working right now. This is the Galeria Valindam. Uh, we have this idea that cities lack of uh, vibrant public space. Uh, but we also have this idea of cities having lots of, or an abundance of, 
residual and depressed space. So uh, we decided one day, why don't we just use the space we already have and start changing it. So that's me on the picture. Uh, what's lighter, cheaper, and quicker to change a place? Well, just do it yourself. So we ask a friend to give us some uh, tools, and we, with my wife, enter this alley and start uh, creating like an optimal minimum statement in the place so we could invite people to do something. Uh, we invite them to a galleria. This was really funny because uh, this alley was not in people's mind when we were working about it. So when we invite people to a galleria, Valindam, in, in, they were thinking they will find a very nice place with lots of wine and cheese, like yesterday. Uh, but at the end, they found they, they found themselves being invited to this uh, back alley, to this. Uh, but now it's not that ugly because now it has a dog in it and lots of people talking around. We invite people to send us photographs, so we print them in, in, in bigger sizes and just place them on the wall. So uh, at the end, it was a gallery because it, it accomplished the mission of a gallery that is to show art and sell art and convince people to enjoy the place. So that's, that's the whole point of our project, is to find empty space, depressed space in our cities and start inserting public life in it. Uh, maybe we do not have the money to change the physical aspect of the place. Maybe we do not have the, the proper alliance with, with government or other institutions to uh, invest in a different way, but that's the lighter, cheaper, and quicker way of doing it, is just be creative and reimagine places in different ways. So we started doing a different approach. We asked lots of architects, uh, because they're really good with, with uh, renders and all this. They, they really are good selling us ideas that do not exist in a place. And we asked them to reimagine what could happen in this alley. So uh, we started with the ideas they were giving us. We started doing uh, conferences, talks, uh, documentaries, uh, Here's, here's myself again. I'm teaching a, a lot of people from Querétaro that it's a very conservative uh, city in Mexico. I'm teaching them to, to, uh, to act like uh, tactical urbanists. So I'm teaching them how to break the laws and do things that nobody is expecting to, to have on the streets. Um, we invited people to screenings, documentaries. We have... Uh, uh, bicycle collectives to using the place as a gathering place so they can teach. Uh, because we found another thing is that people uh, maybe has the, res the resources for what they are doing, but maybe they don't have the place of doing it. So we started to join a lot of people who could be using this, this space. And, and now we have a program that is working from uh, every Thursday and every Sunday in, in Querétaro. And we're doing this, uh, the, the more, the bigger expense we have in this project is for me being here today talking to you. Uh, because we haven't even invested, not even $200 on doing this project for a year. So you can do it lighter, you can do it quicker, and you can do it cheaper. Um, now people is joining us. At the beginning, it was an invitation. You, you, you receive an invitation for a gallery opening, and, and you decide if you w will be challenged for, on the invitation. But now there's people who is just coming by because they already know there's something happening in the street. Um, this, for example, is a, a, a sewing, how do you say, so, sewing, a bordado. It's a workshop for, for bordados. And it's really, really nice because this day, particularly, no one uh, was invited by us. So there was lots of, of men, Mexican men are very, very like manly, you know, machos. And they found themselves in a very weird position in the middle of an unknown alley, uh, bordando with lots of strangers. So we even had Jangel speaking in one of our... Uh, no, well, he wasn't speaking to us. This is just a, a screen of, of the human scale. But we tricked the producers of human scale uh, in believing that we have a real gallery in Querétaro and that we were willing, that we were willing to screen the, the, the documentary. So they sent it to us. And we had the opportunity uh, to show it to... This, this was one of the, 
This, there was around 100 people this night uh, with us in the alley. It was the first night we actually intervened at night because we started to think about, okay, we have something happening during the day, but we need to uh, make something happen in, in the evenings. Well, uh, as we speak, uh, last week, that's why Jimena, who should be here talking to you about this project, uh, she's in Querétaro because for the first time in one year, we have received a small grant from government. And this is funny because at the beginning we asked lots of people from, for government to, uh, to support us and they even didn't know where the street was. So they couldn't give us any money because the street didn't appear on, on city map. Uh, <laughs> we tried to approach uh, parks and recreation but they couldn't give us any support. So we start looking for somebody who was interested in our project, and this project is that it's about changing a street and, and making a public space in the city. It's not supported by, by the people in government who should be supporting it, but it's supported by people in, in uh, the cultural sector, uh, people from Joe's secretariats, and people from tourists in, in the city. So that's the whole point of our presentation. Please reimagine the places and let's change them together. Thank you very much. Oops. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm co-founder of Bella Rua. Our goal is to transform empty public spaces into inviting public spaces for people. And to create inviting public spaces, we need to know what people need and desire, right? But we have a problem. When we ask people what they think of a place like this, the answer we usually get is, oh, it's okay. It's just a street or it's just a square. Okay, it's not that ugly, it's kind of cute, but people can imagine themselves doing anything else in this place. So we felt the need to create a new method for studying public spaces and understanding how to make them more attractive to people. A constructive method that shows people how a public space can be used in other ways than just for standing there, that lets us observe how people react to new activities and inspire people to contribute to new ideas. A method so fun that people won't even realize they are participating in a public space study. The solution we've created is Rua ao Cubo, or Street Cubed. It is a giant cube that is set up in any public space for a couple of weeks, offering a basic structure so people can enjoy the space, such as modular boxes, those colored ones, that people can use as benches or tables, local artist exhibitions, games, a free library, panels that gather information Oops, oops, music instruments. And now the panels that gather information on who people are, where they live, what they need and want. And at night, it illuminates the square. But that's not all. The cube also offers cultural agendas, things like concerts, creative workshops for kids and for grown-ups, Cinema, the shape of the cube is flexible. It can be reconfigured according to the activities, as you can see for this event. Exercises, and a lot more. We chose to launch the project at a newly renovated square, because even this renovated space looked like this all the time, empty. The square is located between the neighborhoods of Pinheiros and Butantã, in Sao Paulo. It is this green point, this green area, and it is 300 square meters. The white represents the private spaces and the gray are the public spaces like street and avenues. And those are the main avenues with heavy traffic and the blue is the Pinheiros River. This is the transit system like metro stations and bus stations. And the orange dots are the places that attract the most amount of people to the neighborhood. They are mostly big companies. Actually, this is a difficult place for a square because you can't see it from the big avenues or from the surrounding streets. Most people that see the square are heading to the building across the, the street, which is that dot in front of the green area, or coming across the river via the bridge walking, which is already an unpleasant experience. It's dangerous, the river smells, and the cars do too. So 
does this square have the potential to be a useful public space? The ans to answer this question, we analyzed people's behavior before the project and how it changed during the cube experience. Our first observation of people in the square happened on a sunny Thursday. During 15 minutes during lunchtime, 10 men and 5 women were in the square, and they did 8 different things, like eating and smoking. The Thursday, with the cube, we made another observation. And a group of people that work in the neighborhood grabbed the acoustic guitar and started a small concert. No one asked them to do that, and that was the result. Almost 600% increase of people that stayed in the square at that time. And we noted seven new uses of the square, like playing music and lying down on the benches. These are the numbers of 15 minutes of research during the morning, lunchtime, afternoon, and night, comparing the Thursday before and during the cube. Saturday night before the cube, with a bit of a cold weather for Sao Paulo, again, 15 minutes of research, and these three people, they left so quickly that we couldn't even get them in the picture. But this is what they were doing, just uh, walking around, no seating. Saturday, during, during the Cube, at the same hour and a bit colder, we had a concert this night. And this is what happened. More than 9,000% increase of people that stayed in the square. We didn't see that coming. And now we know that, yeah, this square has potential to be a public space full of life. We just have to give them some experience and some excuse to be there. People were dancing, singing with the band. We saw lots of kids, families, and younger people all together. And this is the comparison of a Saturday before and during the Cube, with only 15 minutes of research gathered during the morning, lunchtime, afternoon, and night. The music activities were the ones with more people, probably because this is a noisy square, so I think the music makes it more pleasant. And these are the most frequent desires and needs we see in the research. There are some basic needs like water for drinking and restrooms, and of course, free Wi-Fi. But this is just a summary of the study, and we mounted this presentation only three days after the project was finished. Uh, we, we're analyzing all the data, and soon we'll be able to suggest a cultural agenda and a structural changes to permanently transform the square into a place full of life. We are going to use this experience to convince the government and the private sector that this square needs change, and we need their help to do it. Feel free to contact me if you'd like to know more about the study. We're open to new partnerships to try the study method in other cities and countries. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I will be talking about Paraguay and about a neighborhood nestled of one of the seven hills of Asuncion. Uh, this site is a chapter of history, a remnant of the genesis of Asuncion. In the life of the colonial times, the order was dictated by convenience of use of the spaces. Nowadays, this place still retains the sampling and form of use of those times. It's one of the few vestiges of when the city became regular. Welcome to the bohemian style of a small Spanish towns, the San Jeronimo neighborhood. I hope you enjoy the photographic tour. This is a low income urban area, home of artists and laundresses. However, they have a sign of common ident identity, the territory in which they live and their streets. To rescue this place, the revitalization of the urban space was essential. But talking about urban space in a settlement where there are no green leisure areas was quite a big challenge. Here we were in 2001, in a place where the only free space was the street. As a starting point, we have to change our individual vision of as an architects or planners if you want to improve that street. We have to thought the street as a social fact, as a tool for the physical space, social community, personal and family life of the people who live there. The proposed solution has to be designed for the maximum economy of the resources and generate the greatest impact to the community. 
actually the solution came from the residents, that they just thought that with some painting or some lighting and a few information signs will help to improve the streets. They were excited about the re revitalization project that will erase the bitter flavor of be being considered a slum. This is the change that we started to do to happen. And they were not wrong. Only over the years and the gradually of those ideas became true. The first the cleaning, then the painting and the lighting and the signs, when they get a little bit of budget, the image of this this place totally changed. It was before, it was after. This was a place where it's very important is the entrance, and this is the after, a little bit of decoration. And actually now, I will say that the present day I have is to say that it's the new attraction neighborhood of Asuncion. The streets became the meeting point of the neighborhood. The events took place on the access road, attended by a good number of neighborhood residents and not residents, especially the young people who gave the festive air with the sound of music or the different activities, called cultural activities. The improvement of this public space resulted in the development of this sense of community rarely seen in the city. The site responds to the shape of a way of life of characteristic of the popular sectors. Putting aside particular problems of overcrowding, there is a natural form of social so solidarity here. Young people who go to this place say that once you visit San Jerónimo, it's hard to live there. Currently, the district has a chapel where religious community gathers, educational institutions, and other training and recreation places. From this platform, the community organizes religious, cultural, and social events. And there is a sports club that has more than 86 years. It's the San Jerónimo and Hell Entertaining Hollywood Volleyball and Football Games. And San Jerónimo is a community that is changing the face of Asunción. The place define, definite their own forms of movement, primarily because it's not a very big, and second, because they did not need a major width that give way to people. Has a privileged view of the city. And who wander into La Loma San Jerónimo, they visit a rich, a rich experience of urban spaces, stairways, corners, and the warmth of the people who live there. The idea of the private space practically does not exist. Since to get to places like this, this viewpoint, you must go through the step of a home of some of the neighborhoods. It's a kind of agreement in which I give a part of my own good to, for the common good of my community. Its spatial and functional internal structure is introverted, introverted with peculiar path. Its current urban peculiarity with alleys and buildings in tight spaces and stone promontories remember the first time of, of the spontaneous settlement. Also has no programs or activities that generate excessive noise added to the control and restricted access to the car makes that the engine noise and toxic gases do not affect the sector in a direct way. The streets of three to four meters are generally paved and have sidewalks, but by its constitution, the urban behavior is very different in this place. Within this settlement, pedestrian circulation is mostly passive, and there are several areas where vehicular traffic is zero becoming an enabled environment for the human and not for the machine. The colorful houses and home makes the neighborhood a very unique place. And it's a place that takes you back to the past, like several cities in South America. Concluding and basing on the experience of uh, which I have the opportunity to work in this project during my university years, I will leave a message that say, that say this. If the street changes, change the neighborhood. If the neighborhood changes, change the city. If the city changes, change the country. If the country changes, change a part of the world. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Libertad Zavala, vengo de la ciudad de Zapopan, en el estado de Jalisco, en México. 
Y lo que les vengo a presentar el día de hoy es un programa municipal con el que trabajamos, que se llama Barrios Amables. Como el nombre lo dice, lo que buscamos es generar barrios más amables, pero por medio del ciudadano. Entendemos que el núcleo más importante es nuestro barrio y tenemos aquí, es un significado de las dinámicas urbanas que se gestan en el núcleo de la ciudad, el barrio. Nosotros creemos que la vida, cuando uno es más pequeño, tu mundo es tu cuadra y es donde desarrollas todo tipo de actividades, desde jugar fútbol, tener una fiesta y es por lo que estamos buscando recuperar cuadra por cuadra dentro del de programa. Creemos en la vida colectiva y creemos que quien cambia la ciudad son sus ciudadanos. Trabajamos en tres años, las administraciones en, el, en México duran, las administraciones municipales duran tres años, entonces el programa está pensado a tres años. En el primer año lo que buscamos es generar apropiación y sobre todo tener un vínculo cercano como funcionarios públicos y con la ciudadanía. En México, no sé, en otros países de América Latina, la situación con los funcionarios públicos siempre es lejana y sobre todo es mal vista. Entonces, nosotros lo que buscamos es ser un vínculo y ser facilitadores en este primer año. Lo logramos llevando actividades a espacios públicos como funciones de cine, como algo con teatro y en el segundo momento tenemos el empoderamiento. Las ciudades van a cambiar solo si sus ciudadanos quieren transformarlas. Podemos quejarnos mucho, pero si no hacemos nada, ahí está. Entonces, en el tercer año lo que buscamos es, después de que ya trabajamos, empoderamos a estos ciudadanos, les dimos herramientas, buscamos que ellos sigan por sí solos, porque no sabemos si el programa sigue otros tres años o no sigue, entonces dejamos una semillita y esperemos que germine. Estos son los tres, la atracción y el conocimiento, la vida en el espacio público, la capacitación y activación de agentes barriales, lo que les decía del empoderamiento. Damos herramientas o compartimos conocimiento, nosotros no somos expertos. Quienes son los expertos son los habitantes de cada uno de estos barrios. Trabajamos con más de 32 barrios en el municipio de Zapopan. El municipio de Zapopan es el más grande que tiene el área metropolitana de Guadalajara, donde hay más de 500 colonias o 500 barrios. Nosotros alcanzamos a trabajar con 32. El tercero es este acompañamiento de autogestión. Ya tenemos las herramientas, ahora ellos tienen que poner en marcha todo lo aprendido. Citamos mucho a Jane Jacobs en nuestro ir y venir porque ella tenía muy claro lo que era transformar y era participar. Ella era una ciudadana de a pie, una ciudadana que, que creía y sobre todo amaba el lugar donde habitaba y lo que buscamos es que la mayoría de las personas sí aman el lugar donde, donde habitan, pero no saben cómo transformarlo, no tienen idea porque creen que es imposible que tiene que venir el gobierno a transformarnos nuestros espacios cuando nosotros somos quienes los cohabitamos. Este es un ejemplo, nosotros no trabajamos solos, trabajamos en conjunto con un despacho que se llama Cuadro Urbanismo. Este despacho es el que rediseñó el programa Barrios Amables y ¿cómo empezamos? Sí trabajamos con 32 comunidades, pero estas comunidades realizan un diagnóstico participativo y sobre todo de percepción. Estos niños, como verán, pues son menores de 12 años y ellos nos pueden decir cuáles son los lugares más seguros donde ellos van a jugar, cuál es el lugar más inseguro donde tal vez no los dejan atravesarla, que es la avenida periférico, que es una vialidad muy importante, y cuáles son los lugares que les gustaría mejorar. Entonces, quien nos da esta sensibilidad son los niños, son los niños que no tienen malicia, pero sí tienen muchas ganas de disfrutar la ciudad y son los que se atreven a seguir disfrutándola. Entonces, nuestra premisa es que el experto del barrio es el vecino, quien lo habita, quien vive ahí, quien está a las 24 horas, es quien nos puede decir qué es lo que necesita. Y en base a esto hay una frase de Jankel que me gusta mucho, que ningún niño pide algo para Navidad que no sabe y la gente nunca va a pedir mejoras en sus ciudades que no están en su repertorio. Entonces, eso pasa cotidianamente en nuestras ciudades, creo que en América Latina vemos ejemplos como el de Nueva York, vemos espacios recuperados, pero los vemos allá y los vemos muy lejanos. En cambio, si nos dicen, les vamos a quitar, no sé, quien conozca el Distrito Federal, les vamos a quitar carriles insurgentes como pasó cuando implementaron el sistema de bici pública, la gente gritó. 
Entonces, hay que darles a conocer más cosas, hay que bajar la, el urbanismo, la planificación, el diseño de espacios urbanos a la ciudadanía, que es la que tiene que diseñar estos espacios. Nosotros también buscamos resignificar los espacios en esta era digital mediante Twitter y Facebook, usando las redes sociales y compartiendo mediante cuatro hashtags sus actividades como vecinos de un barrio, que es donde comes, que puedes llamarlo consume barrio, y tenemos en mi barrio, ¿qué actividades puede haber en tu barrio? Voces barrio, que eso es muy interesante, que son todas estas historias que pueden surgir de un espacio público, de una calle, de la casa de alguien, pero que van formando las nuevas historias de la ciudad. ¿Una explicación? Este es uno de los proyectos que estamos en marcha, es un huerto comunitario. Y este huerto fue una gestión a tres niveles de gobierno, federal, estatal y municipal. Son cinco camas, cuatro camas de cultivo en un espacio semipúblico, porque es un, una instancia municipal, donde un grupo de señoras, son diez señoras, llevan a cabo trabajo de, de huerto en conjunto con sus hijos y es un espacio donde hemos logrado co-crear con ellos y sobre todo compartir un conocimiento. Mi barrio y mi cultura es en este segundo año de empoderamiento donde estamos brindando herramientas. Creemos que una de las herramientas, y ya lo veíamos ahorita con el proyecto de nuestra compañera, son las actividades. Las actividades pueden detonar la vida en un espacio público. Puede ser un excelente diseño, pero si no tiene actividades, no tiene vida. Entonces, mi barrio y mi cultura, que es un diplomado que estamos impartiendo, lo que busca es generar gestores culturales de barrio, que rescatemos nuestra identidad mediante actividades culturales. Circuito Pedal, Circuito Pedal es una escuela de ciclismo urbano que hemos puesto en marcha desde el año pasado y sobre todo que trabajamos con niños. Mucho de nuestro trabajo va con niños porque los niños son el futuro de las ciudades, son el futuro del país. Entonces ellos son más perceptivos, ellos te pueden decir qué está pasando, no tienen pelos en la lengua y con ellos trabajamos, digamos que muy bien y son quienes se llevan los mejores consejos para papá y para mamá y qué mejor que tu hijo te diga cómo circular en la ciudad. Barriorama es otra de las actividades que estamos llevando a cabo y esta es la, un ejemplo. Tenemos espacios en abandono, deteriorados, pero deteriorados no nada más por el gobierno ni abandonados, sino por los mismos vecinos, por los ciudadanos. Hasta que surge alguien y levanta la mano y dice, quiero mejorar mi espacio, pues sí, vamos a hacerlo en conjunto. Todo el trabajo, creo que estamos acostumbrados en mi país a que el gobierno nos dé todo y creo que llegó el momento en que tenemos que colaborar si no, no podemos construir. Y aquí está el ejemplo, este es el equipo de trabajo, si se fijan también hay muchos niños y personas de la tercera edad que son los más participativos, los niños aprenden en este proceso a mezclar colores y sobre todo se les genera un, un sentimiento de apropiación y arraigo sobre estos espacios públicos que vieron construidos cuando ellos nacieron, pero que ahora ellos les ponen color. Y pues para terminar, seguimos en búsqueda de estos ciudadanos, agentes barriales, que quieran transformar sus comunidades. Muchas gracias. Hi everyone. Okay, I hope I'm going to get this right. So my name's Kylie Legg, and I'm an architect. It feels like I'm at AA. Um, I, I've got a feeling I'm probably not the only person in the room that is an architect, um, whether or not you're actually practicing and I guess making the monstrosities that everyone's been able to show today, um, or whether or not you're actually um, a participant in obviously this bigger movement, whether or not you started more recently or have been doing it kind of all your life. Um, I'm also a town planner, um, but I guess kind of my day to day life, I call myself a professional placemaker. Um, and I'm going to share with you a project from Australia, which is probably a little bit different, um, especially in the context of some of the projects that we've been seeing from here, because equally it's probably about the same scale, but the scale relative in Australia is very different. So um, the project we're looking at probably overall is going to cost about um, 15 to 20 million dollars to build. Um, and the component that we're going to be sharing today is one that was um, delivered for $40,000 in three months, which is exceptionally short period of time. 
Penrith is on the outskirts of metropolitan Sydney. It's the last centre um, to the northwest before the mountains. So it's kind of an interesting place as well because um, in prior times, uh, before sort of the expansion of the city and the infill of the city, it was actually its own town centre and has a very strong identity in its own right. Um, place Partners is, as I said, a dedicated placemaking consultancy. Um, it can happen and you can make money for it for those people that are actually here in the room starting out on this journey. Um, it's uh, also our sixth birthday today, um, right today, which is very exciting. Um, thanks. Um, and we actually, I was working for three years prior to that as a professional placemaker in Australia. So I guess uh, there's uh, certainly a few companies here that have been around a lot longer than us um, and, and a couple in Australia as well. We are working, I guess, in what we call kind of the three realms of placemaking, looking at this sort of collaborative um, as well as strategic placemaking, the planning for people-focused places, um, as well as the shorter-term tactical intervention that might get us towards that long strategy. And then in terms of sort of, I guess, more opportunistic or organic place enhancements that are more about improving our kind of day-to-day -day lives. And this is just a little book share out the front of our office in Sydney. Um, back to Penrith, though, this is um, the city centre. The yellow area is um, the site that we were looking at. And we were engaged um, by the council. Uh, we went, it was a competitive tender against 33 landscape architecture firms. Um, it was a bit of a, uh, a ripple effect, I think, probably in, um, in Sydney and, and even in Australia, that a placemaking organisation was successful against um, the incumbent and some very, very large with a lot of experience. And the main reason I think that was, and, and certainly it showed itself through the project, is that even though it was kind of predominantly a landscape project, um, the main intention of it was economic development. And the economic development component of the council, of the government, could see that they weren't going to get it just from the traditional way of approaching um, street enhancements. Uh, the current environment is very average um, and because of that it's not really used. The sort of the dominant cultural sort of behaviours are, are to park your car as close as you can to the shop that you're going to to get in and to get out as quickly as possible and there's really no opportunities for socialisation or any kind of extended trading outdoors. The process that um, we go through is, is research, research, research. Um, and the first thing we do is to try and understand what the influences are on the place, both externally, so politics or the sort of forecasting of demographic trends, but then also meeting with people. Um, we also um, don't rely just on the people that we speak to. We also look at the people that we don't get a chance to talk to. So extensive um, mapping of actual people's behaviours and where they're doing different behaviours so that we can actually look at those um, environments and try and learn from them and understand, well, why are people spending time in this location but they're only moving through in this location and using it again as a trigger. Um, and we collected all of this data probably over about a four to five month period in the original master planning stage um, and found out that people wanted very simple things. And one of the kind of uh, tricky things, I guess, working with government and also with developers is that sometimes they're afraid to ask people because they think they're going to get told that they need something incredibly different. But in fact, people just wanted it to be greener, to be slower and to actually be more social. Um, so it was something that they were saying, we actually want a centre we can spend time in. The master plan itself, um, obviously we get caught up at some point in just having the illustration of what is actually a huge amount of thought and there's a whole lot of words and different diagrams and processes that go together. It was also very limited because um, they were incredibly resistant to us changing any of the traffic conditions. So we had between the gutter and the built, the building edge. Um, and it, it doesn't have very much space, as you can actually see there. Um, but what we did was to say, well, every time that we could provide a, a place to cross the road, any time that we could provide a place to, to actually sit down or to spend time, that we would maximise that rather than doing increasing in pavement widths, we'd be doing very, very sort of clear points which would um, uh, enhance the ability to cross the street and have people bounce down the street, but also in those places that we could actually make to be really good rather than average across the whole area. 
Um, the project that I wanted to talk to you about is this little triangle area. It actually doesn't, I mean, that's the green of the master plan saying we conceptually see this as a park in the future. Um, at the moment, it's a semicircle of asphalt and a bit of a one-way road. Can't possibly be me already, are you kidding me? This is what it looks like. Um, this is what it looked like. And, uh, nobody ever went there. It was completely um, unattractive. However, just to the left of this photo, there was a tattoo parlor and a hairdresser, and there's some restaurants kind of behind me in the, in the photo. And so there were things going on there that we thought we could build from. So what we convinced the council um, to do, which was a huge undertaking in its own right, is to do this tactical project where we would bring the community together. So the first thing we did was start telling the community that something was going on, because otherwise they were going to wait probably three years to deliver this project. The first thing was about de-risking the process of actually being really clear to the government and to the stakeholders about what... Uh, how we were going to work together with them and how they could be a part of many different stages of the process. The team that we brought together um, for the actual project sort of facilitation also included um, Mike Lydon um, from the, the Streets Collective in the US, um, university students, um, as well as the councillors, um, which was really important, council staff, um, and as many creatives from the actual community as possible, including businesses, which we saw as actually being creative in this environment because they were actually making things. Uh, the second part of the de-risking the process was that instead of opening it up and saying, I'll design anything you want, because of the short turnaround, we actually developed a kit of parts, a kit of, um, of objects, of paints, of different textures, of found objects that we actually got the engineers to approve prior to us um, actually going to the workshop, um, and that made the council feel very safe. The other part is that we knew that we had a very limited budget, so everything was priced prior, and the community were, when they were given these sort of cards that they could work with, and they could also create their own cards, um, they were priced so they knew they had their budget for their component. We didn't really know what was gonna happen. Um, it was kind of, we did a, a bit of talking at the beginning. We gave them big plans. We put them into groups. They went out on the street and started using chalk um, and came up with these kind of, and we had a big pile of materials they could use or not use. Um, they chose to make these sort of wonderful mixture of models and drawings. Um, obviously these people are not, um, trained in kind of any design. What was really interesting though is that the top image is the collation of the three groups that worked on three different parts and each one of them had kind of built a unique identity for their section of, of the area um, as well as the role and function of that space, how it was going to be something that the community actually was missing um, in the current environment. And the drawing underneath is just simply the translation of that. So it's almost kind of completely exactly what the, the, the community wanted. The only thing was sort of um, a little bit of stuff for disability and making sure the widths of pathways were correct. The construction itself only took five days, which in Australia is like saying we flew to the moon and back in, in you know, and we built our own rocket. Um, it's just almost impossible. And the only way that we could do this was to make it more like an installation than um, an actual construction. So uh, these concrete blocks, the things, are actually the leftover waste at the end of a day when the concrete truck goes back to the factory. They empty out the concrete from the truck into these moulds, and then they just go and sit in this mortuary of of concrete blocks. They were incredibly cheap, very stable, and also happened to be the right height, so if a child fell over off them, you didn't need to put the soft fall, which would have cost us millions. Um, we did a deal with the tree company to actually lend us the trees for the year and got these amazing, fantastic trees. We got the local council maintenance guys to end up getting involved. They were so excited to be doing something creative and wonderful that they came and volunteered and built uh, all the planter boxes and things for us. Um, and now, because of that, also uh, they're maintaining it all the time. Um, it's the first time, and you can see this, the left-hand image is the actual street. Uh, the right top image, you can see the bit of the grass street. Because we already had um, gutters, we could just lay turf, like live turf, in between the gutters and not have the issues with safety. Um, and then the community big events, as well as just small kind of chilling out areas, which they didn't have in the whole area of town before we did this project. 
Um, the third kind of area, as I said, this idea of moving into the organic where we kind of let go of things is now seeing how the community is using it. When we first went in and did our research, we would never see children in the town centre um, and very rarely even with their parents. They just weren't being taken there because the perception was that it was incredibly dangerous. Uh, the last time I went there, um, and unfortunately I couldn't find the photo just before I left, there were children busking by themselves in this place with their kind of musical instruments and, it, and it's just shifted the whole community in terms of what they think is possible. It's also given us the opportunity to test our place score, um, which looks at kind of the key elements of place attraction and place attachment. In, um, and so what we do, this is something that anyone can use, as, uh, whether or not it's a lay person. Uh, 2013, 2014 scores. Before, it was a 26 out of 100. Now it's 76 out of 100. This actually also gives confidence to council in terms of financing future projects and also is a really good tool for getting new projects as well. Um, and lastly, just because I know that they're all here and they've been such wonderful support, is that this project was also just received a commendation from the Australian and Asia Pacific Place Leaders Organisation. So thanks to them for supporting us as well. Thank you. I just have to wait a second for my special guest. All right, I'll take a little bit of a video first. I can't really believe I'm here. I can prove to my girlfriend that I was here too. Um, okay, I'll introduce myself. Um, how do I use this thing? How do I go to the next slide? Sweet. <laughs> You may have seen him in Fred Kent's uh, photos earlier today. So my name is Nick Broad. Um, I founded the Busking Project because um, I used to live with a subway violinist. <laughs> He's going to do that for five minutes. So, uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to live with a subway violinist called Chen Kong. Uh, who had been a child prodigy back in China, but then Chairman Mao's cultural revolution came along, criminalized classical music, um, and he had to stop playing. So his bourgeois family was punished, and uh, <laughs> uh, they became very poor, and at one moment he was um, teaching people how to play the violin in secret in return for heads of cabbage. That's how poor they'd become. So to cut a long story short, he escaped to New York, got a full scholarship at Manners College of Music, uh, and despite rave reviews, he decided that if he wanted somebody telling him what to play, he could go back to China for that level of control. So instead, he decided to become a street performer. Um, for 18 years, Chen performed on the 57th Street F train uh, subway stop. Every time I went to see him uh, perform, I saw children dance, I saw people hold hands, um, I saw uh, strangers making eye contact on the subway, which, as you know, is like a death wish in New York. You just never make eye contact in the subway. Um, I've been offered fellatioed for doing that. It just, you just wouldn't normally do it. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, on that grimy subway platform, um, I discovered the transformative power of art. Um, so I probably shouldn't have said that. My apologies. <laughs> uh, Chen was incredible. He was unique. Um, and he was also fined by the New York City Police Department so often that he eventually had to leave New York uh, to find a city that was more encouraging for him. So he'd escaped one tyranny for his art and then found himself a criminal uh, in the land of the free. So this really got to me. Uh, so I looked into it and found that Chen was not alone. Uh, the criminalization of busking is a global problem. So in 2011, I traveled to 40 cities in 30 countries on five continents to film and interview street performers. And what we discovered was, of course, a distinct correlation uh, between the way that buskers are treated and the quality of art that they produce. Where buskers are encouraged and tipped well, treated like artists, and made to feel like a part of the policy process, uh, of course, the art is fantastic. Uh, Covent Garden, Pier 39, Gmail Fanar, the Royal Mile, you know, they're all incredible places to watch street, street shows. 
And where buskers are treated like criminals, of course, the art isn't very good. It's a complete no-brainer. But for some reason, authorities around the world believe that they can somehow improve the quality of art uh, by making it harder to perform through licensing, auditions, and threats. This is in South Africa. That busker is blind, by the way. Um, on our trip, we found an increasingly controlled landscape of anti-busking legislation with licensing fees, applications that have to be done in writing, one day a year auditions where a council appointed panel deems whether or not you're a fit and proper person, enough to perform for free on the streets. <laughs> um, and a profusion of arbitrary restrictions, fines, equipment confiscations, and arrests. Um, and yet, academics, by the way, that's Diego, who coincidentally is from uh, Buenos Aires. Um, and yet, academics, placemakers, urban planners uh, increasingly consider street performance to be a viable way of uh, revitalizing cities. After all, buskers don't require infrastructure, they don't require payment, it's nice. Um, they, uh, they're self-regulating if they're made to feel a part of the team. Um, and they're far more en engaging, dare I say it, than a bench or a bronze sculpture. Um, as far as lighter, quicker, cheaper projects go, the busker is king. Just as an example, the Glastonbury Music Festival costs 22 million pounds to put on. It entertains 175,000 people, wealthy people, <laughs> um, at a roughly 125 pounds per head, which is why I think they charge 200 pounds a ticket or something. Uh, the, Ed the Royal Mile at the Edinburgh Fringe costs 150,000 pounds. It entertains over a million people every year at a price of 15 pence per head. That's one 800th of the price. And yet, despite adding so much value to the fringe, which brings in 88 million pounds to the Edinburgh economy, buskers are not mentioned in their program. You can find them on their website, but they're not mentioned in the program. And so it's finally time to give buskers the benefits, uh, uh, recognize, uh, recognition for the benefits they bring. So what I'm about to say may discredit me as an extremist, but uh, I don't think that busking is just one way, but the most honorable way of making a living out of art. There's no PR, no cult of celebrity, no Facebook popularity contest, no entrance fees or service charges or security guards or fences, no clever lighting, no fancy billboards, no sponsorship deals and definitely no product placements, <laughs> no redefining the theoretical framework of coexisting interstitial relationships via nonlinear temporal works. I came up with that myself, thank you. <laughs> Just an artist and his audience. So the Busking Project uh, is a social network for street performers. Uh, we support, uh, support, promote, and celebrate them, give them a way of earning cash in an increasingly cashless society, um, and we're trying to explain to authorities ac across the globe that busking is not a crime. We're helping young, talented artists get off unemployment benefits, get discovered, and avoid arrest. We've already had around 1,000 buskers uh, sign up in 57 countries. And at the moment, we're not really providing them anything. <laughs> uh, they just know about us, and they know that this is a, something, a service that they want, they need, and they currently don't have access to. So our research, uh, Vivian will talk about, um, that's also wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, Vivian will talk about tomorrow. Uh, we do have a phone app, and uh, we do festivals, uh, documentary, and books. I can tell you about that later. Um, and I was going to end with our mission and all of our future, future of Places stuff. But instead, uh, thanks to yesterday, I want to show you uh, a little card that a street performer uh, gave us yesterday while we were walking around town. And roughly translated, that says, and this is by complete coincidence, I didn't know about this, music in the street is not a crime. The solo musicians, bands, and orchestras that play on the streets, plazas, subways, and buses, we are planning a law that protects us. So if you want to know more about that, we're planning a trip to meet local street performers from Buenos Aires tomorrow at 6 p.m., so you can come with us for that. Uh, we have basically, hopefully, not really sure yet, line them up along Lavache Street, uh, and they will be answering questions and performing for your entertainment. And I'll just end by saying that the sterilization of our city centers has to stop. Uh, these performers are already in your city. <laughs> Can't believe you're still doing that. <laughs> um, waiting to get involved in your projects, and they need your help, but thankfully, this is a highly visible, high impact, and highly entertaining uh, field to work in, and I refer you to my uh, my next slide. Thank you very much.
So uh, I just finished. Th uh, these artists are your on-the-ground placemakers. Um, they are street performers. This is their job. So if you like their show, uh, please take 10 or 20 pesos out of your wallets and give them the rest. Actually, give it to me, and I will distribute it, because the other guy, the windy guy, has gone home already. So I'll give it to him tomorrow. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I can't hold a pose for ten, five minutes, and I definitely can't dance the tango, so I don't think I have anything more to add other than thank you for all hanging in here and staying with us. And uh, let's all make our way over to the City Hall for the reception. Okay? Okay.